Okay, welcome everyone to this continuation of what are my favorite fields, uh, theorems, whatever, a very biased collection about something I probably can't pronounce. And that's, that's a little bit pathetic, um, because I'm right now not quite sure whether it's a matroid or a metroid. Um, I have no idea, it doesn't matter at all, I probably will say matroid. Um, so what is a matroid? And yeah, so what is matroid theory? It's kind of a nice generalization as we will see of both linear algebra and graph theory and it, in some sense as i said it's a generalization of both and in some sense it's a generalization of neither mm -hmm. somehow it's more kind of taking uh, properties of the field and observe that they are kind of those two fields and observe that they are the same in both fields and then kind of forming a new theory mixing those properties so it's Thinking about it as a generalization of those is not far off, but it's not quite right either. It's not, not really generalizing linear algebra. We'll see uh, what I mean. And it's kind of very surprising. The, the, the main theorem that I'm going to show you is like really surprising. I'll comment on that um, as we go there. Okay, so what is a fundamental property of a basis? So what makes the basis of a vector space special? So everything today is finite. Uh, so we have some finite vector space. And we can think of, well, here's a matrix. So, and we want the image, we want the basis for the image, and we can choose various bases for the image depending on kind of the type of, what is it, column vectors we want to choose. So here, for example, we have, for example, this one and whatever, uh, let's do a different color. This one is here, and maybe this one is, is this one, possible. And then there's another one which is here, but I could have chosen different column vectors. Uh, but no matter what I do, I can always choose them. So I will always find the basis. And again, no matter how I choose them, I'm gonna imagine a really large matrix. There will be like a zillion many choices. But no matter what I do, um, kind of the, the dimension is always the same. Dimension is usually called the rank in this case. For some reasons, people sometimes like to call the dimension the rank. Whenever I say rank, you should think dimension. Anyway, so the rank is always the same. So you have the same number of matrices, uh, so the same number of basis vectors. And you can always have this fun exchange property. Yeah? So if you have one vector, you can just exchange it with another one without losing the properties of uh, being a basis. You can exchange them between them. And that's this idea. Of, well, the base change, uh, sorry, the base inter is this idea of in linear algebra that uh, basis has always the same number of vectors, and you can kind of, if you want to take out one, you can put out, could put in another without ruin ruining the property of being a basis. If you're a little bit careful that they are still linear independent. Okay, that sounds fair enough, like linear algebra. Um, everyone likes linear algebra. I hope you do like linear algebra. Linear algebra is really powerful. But here's something that also everyone likes. I hope you like graph theory. Everyone likes graph theory. Graph theory is very powerful. And, and the fundamental property of forests, trees. Forest is just a non-connected tree. Kind of fun terminology, by the way. So uh, a graph without cycles is called a tree because it looks like something like this usually, right? So it looks like, like a tree type thing. And if it's not connected, you call it a forest. It's a collection of trees. Finally, very rare, <laughs> very rare in mathematics that actually the name makes some sense. Here it does um, somehow. Anyway, so whenever I say forest, you could think tree. And a spanning tree is just any graph and you take out uh, edges until you hit a tree and you will always find spanning trees. So here in my background illustration, I have this graph, which is not cycle free, so it's not a tree, but I have whatever, uh, 16 spanning trees. Right? For example, I could just take those edges here uh, and I would have the corresponding spanning tree. Cool. So what is so fundamental and interesting about trees? Well, <laughs> spanning trees, spanning forests, I, as I said, I will go through the between forests and trees all the time. Anyway, hope you will forgive me. 
Anyway, they exist. Yeah? So you can easily prove existence if you want. Um, and again, you can always exchange edges between them and you can go from one to the other. So here, for example, this edge here, uh, you can kind of exchange it with, you can exchange those edges here and you can go from here to here. It kind of looks very similar to the base exchange property of linear algebra. And people realized that uh, surprisingly late in the 1930s roughly and said hmm, 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 maybe we can find one mass object which is like both at once like a spanning forest and the bases and that's exactly where the notion of a matroid matroid metroid who knows comes from it is a pair with a finite set and uh, whatever that is uh, usually something like an indexing set, the number of, vert number of vertices or something, and uh, something in the power set, which is really just the bases, such that, okay, whatever I choose shouldn't be empty. That's very good. And whenever I have something, I have this base exchange property. It's really just written out here. And it's just the definition of uh, a matroid, and it's kind of very general. So a fun example of a matroid is this, a uh, Vamos matroid. Well, maybe I should write it because it's impossible to spell correctly, uh, uh, v to pronounce correctly. Spelling is actually not so difficult in this case to pronounce correctly. And it would be something like take eight points and the bases are the collections, all collections of four points, which are not in the picture above. And then you will realize that it actually satisfies uh, the property. And one of the crucial facts about Matroid, which I have not written on um, on the slide, but it immediately essentially follows from this, is that every basis will have the same number of elements. And that, that, that number is called the rank. As I said, rank dimension, people usually use rank and dimension in kind of an interchangeable way. And yeah, so Matroid theory studies Matroids. And yeah, so this is generalization of linear algebra and uh, graphs, if you want. And then there's this theorem, which I find surprising because it kind of gives a, a really good estimate of how many matroids there are. So let's say, um, so there are many, 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 many. Uh, but let's just say MN is the number of matroids of rank N. Yeah, um, The number of matroids of rank N. Yeah, whatever. And it starts off like this. One, one, two, four, nine, whoa, but whatever. And it starts off really harmless. Mm, yeah, but the sequence grows like really fast, as you can already see here. So here you are in the thousands and here you are in the hundreds of thousands. Um, pff, it's kind of a large jump. And people were thinking about how large the sequence actually gets. And yeah, it's really difficult to compute each individual entry. So as far as I know, uh, only the matrix of rank nine are enumerated. So rank 10 is, I think, still open. Let's, so the rank nine should be this one. But you can kind of estimate, and a really good estimate, how many there are. And there are a lot. So here's this estimate. So the log of that number that makes it smaller, yeah? Taking the log makes something very small, it's usually small. And the log of that number is still exponential. <laughs> so there's really, really a lot of them. So the log of that number is bound between those two things. So ignore this one over O of one, uh, one plus O of one. You can ignore it. Let's ignore it. If you don't know what it is, ignore it. Um, so it really says that you have this N, uh, whatever, whatever it is, it's not, it's not terribly important. And then you have the two to the N. Two to the N is kind of squeezing everything anyway. And on the other end, so this is the lower bound, on the other end you have the upper bound, which is almost the same. The only difference is you have, well, a factor of two times square root of two over pi. So you squeeze it actually in a, in a pretty good way. You're not, you're, right, you're not calculating mn precisely, as I said, it's difficult, but you can actually squeeze it um, very efficiently. And if you plot those two, so this guy here and the one with the scalar, you essentially can't distinguish them anymore in uh, in the plot. It's kind of a really good estimate of um, the number 
of uh, Matrites, which is a bit surprising because the number of graphs is actually really difficult uh, to estimate. As I said, again, it's an estimate. You're not really calculating the number. You have some error, but anyway, it's a really strong uh, statement in the sense that the lower and the upper bound are not very different from one another. You might complain that I have taken a lock everywhere so that my lower and upper bound are not very different. The lock is a very forgivable function. Still means that the difference is probably pretty far off. Depends how you want to see it. Yes, I agree. Lock is a very forgivable function. Um, but since everything grows so fast, even if you're off by a few million, does it really matter if you roughly have a growth rate of 2 to the 2 to the end? Um, probably not. Anyway, so it's one of my this really good theorem. It's kind of a really strong, really sharp estimate of uh, the number of uh, matroids. And yeah, so here's a fun example of a matroid. I left the, let it to you to think about it. But uh, it's not just linear algebra, it's not just graph theory. There are many, many other types of matroids. And yeah, so two partitions form a matroid. And the two partition for me is just one of those funny diagrams. Let's say two partition of one, two, three, which are my boundary points at the bottom, one, two, three, and uh, one prime, which are the boundary points at the top, three prime, two partition means everything should come. So you just have pairs of sets. And here my pairs are three, three prime, one prime, two prime, and one, two. And here are the pictures of the two partitions of that set. Yeah. It's kind of fun. And now I'll leave it to you to decide in what sense uh, these form a uh, matroid. And there are a lot of these non-linear algebra, non-graph theory matroid examples, which make this theorem even more impressive. And that's also why the, the number, the explicit number is so hard to get. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope to see you next time.